Okay, welcome to lecture four of Analog Electronics, Basics of C Programming. What on earth is that doing in Analog Electronics? And, um, well, as, as we know from the labs, we've been using our D0 boards driven by, uh, programmed in C to use as test articles in our, for a lot of our experiments. And I've noticed that a lot of people are a little bit hesitant with C. So I hope this is a useful refresher course for you and a beginner's course for the people who have only experienced something like MATLAB. So here's, here's what I want to talk about here. I won't go through everything here, but I hope that provides a nice index for you because I'm hoping that these slides will make an excellent uh, crib sheet to have under your hand when you're writing code and things like that and a nice revision sheet for you. Uh, and be and be useful in, in helping you to get started with C programming. And if you're interested in taking it any further, please give me a shout. Maybe I could do some continuation lectures on this. So yeah, I'm going to take you through all these basics of the main function, creating variables and assignments, and using a few key, few few key constructs. And particularly also, I want to help you out with uh, those of you using C to program uh, D zeros in the lab as well. So this slide should be fairly familiar to anyone who's uh, used D zeros in the board uh, boards in the lab. <coughs> uh, as you can see, this uh, they are a typical example of this pretty common paradigm of a host PC with the tools on board that generates an executable and then using specialist tools downloads over a communication link to an embedded system, as it's called, a target processor. And so the code actually ends up running remotely. So I've got this picture here of, of something that looks uncannily like a DE0. And so, and as, as the picture suggests, it's a, a DE0 is one of many different target boards. And so C is a very useful tool for this sort of uh, target device because it creates very small executables, very fast executables. And there's many tools available which are fully integrated, integrated development environments that allows to download those executables into these target devices and uh, debug them as well in various different ways. So it's also worth knowing, especially if you're familiar with uh, MATLAB, which is what's called an interpreted language, a scripting language, that <laughs> C is, is a compiled language, which is where <coughs> the the source code, the, that text, that human readable text that we're familiar with and we see on the screen, isn't actually anything to do with what's been executed. It's actually been consumed by this, what's called a tool chain, which is a series of tools, the most important one of which is this thing called a compiler. And you'll hear about people, people using the word compiler a lot. In order to generate through various intermediate steps down to this binary machine code executable, which is the actual uh, computer readable code which has been downloaded into the target device. So it's quite important just to know that as a bit of background as to why we're using C rather than a scripted language like MATLAB or TCL and things like that. So the first thing to know about C is, is and this is where everybody generally starts off, is usually the, the start program that people start us off with is a is the quote hello world program where we use this printf and it's and that's often described as being the simplest program. I'd like to take it back a step further actually and say that the that this is the simplest C program you can imagine. This is MAME which is a special kind of special reserved name which the compiler will look for and use that to create the entry point of the program. So in other words that's where execution starts. And as we can see here, there's various definitions. There's the, <coughs> the function itself declares both inputs and outputs. In this case, void means that no, we haven't got any inputs today. And int describes what's going to be reported back through the output of the program as well. And here we go, this return, which is the actual value. So this program is pretty unimaginative. All it does is output a zero. Main very useful point to start. So usually the first thing we'll do after that 
<coughs> is introduce a variable, which uh, I hope is a fairly familiar concept to everyone. <coughs> Anybody who's done any scripting would be used to the idea of variables, which is just the container for information. A little bit different in C, though, and any compiled language, because in, in these languages, we have to, quote, explicitly declare that variable for it can be used. We can't just create it on the fly at any point. And when we, when we declare it, we give it a name, and we also say what type it's going to be. Now, that's probably something which is slightly unfamiliar to people who use scripting languages. They don't know it, but they've been using types, but they use, but they're created implicitly. So in C, we make it much more explicit, and we have this type, and we say we're going to create a variable of type int, which means it's a signed integer. Sign means plus and minus, and it goes up 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to about 65,000, <laughs> plus and minus 32,000. Depends on the size of the processor. So, when we kick off our variable, or, or rather we declare our variable, we can also give it an initialized value. So this is quite a useful first example of a, and what's called an assignment, where we're creating the, the variable, and at the same time, we're setting it to a, an explicit value. So we can see we've got two variables here, only one of which has been explicitly set. And depending on the compiler, if it hasn't been explicitly set, that could end up at anything, or it might sometimes, some compilers will automatically initialized to zero anyway, but it, you can't assume that. And it's quite important to understand that this equals is not equals as in test of equals, it's a becomes, and some, some software engineering pedants insist on using the word becomes, and other languages don't use equals, like for example, uh, Pascal uses colon equals to explicitly state that this is different from an equals as we know it. So we've just had a look at an assignment in the middle of <coughs> the beginning of a, of a piece of code when we create the thing. We can also reassign that value, and this is essentially what software does, is during the process, based on other values, we can either set it to a constant like this, or we can, increment, we can set it relative to something such as itself, or even another variable if we had a slightly more sophisticated program. A, uh, a, something that's well worth pointing out here is this double plus plus. So, and this is one of these funny little bits of shorthand that were introduced uh, into C when it was invented in the 70s. And this is mainly because at that time storage space was at the premium. So that's, that, and that, that explains why C is so sort of terse in its, in its look and sparse. Because they were trying to, even the text was trying to be kept to a minimum. So this plus plus is a shorthand for increment myself. And so that gives rise to the old gag of why C++ is, get, gets its name of it was one more than C. Ho, ho, ho. Assignments. So we've looked at an integer a moment ago. There's a few other types as well, but for the moment, the only two I'm going to talk about in this lecture are going to be int and this other one, which is called float, which is short for floating point var variable type. So this is a, a variable type that consists of what's called a mantis and an exponent. So in other words, that allows the number to trade off precision against uh, the range of the number that can be expressed. So you can see here, so it can have a vast series of, vast range of numbers. And more, and more importantly than that, it can represent real numbers or an approximation thereof. So we can have 1.23, 3.142, things like that, and do calculations with that. So uh, using these tiny fractional numbers. So it's important to understand that the, the precision isn't, isn't infinitely fine. So there are such things as truncation errors when dealing with floating point. So we've got a 32-bit float here. There are actually other ones as well, but we'll talk about that another day. So in this slide, you can see as well, that, that also implies that constants associated with floats are a little bit different as well. We're actually expressing explicitly with a decimal point there because, of course, we could have fractions of an integer value for our float. So very useful 
when you're doing engineering control loops and things like that, so you're reading in a voltage, say, and generally you'll be storing that as a float. So, uh, from those assignments we've had so far, I've just been putting those raw numbers in. I'll just go back here, 0, uh, 1.0. That's actually quite bad programming t uh, practice. Um, various reasons that I don't want to go into too much detail with. But it's much more, much more useful if, if it's set with a, uh, an explicitly defined constant. So, for example, here, I've declared, I've created a constant name called default int value. So you can imagine we could, we could then use that same tag, and I'm going to use the word tag, that constant name, wherever we create an int, for example, in a program, so that we only define it once. And then if we changed our minds about what that default was going to be, we'd only have to change it once, and the change would ripple right through the program. <coughs> now, the way that um, constant is defined is using this interesting hash define statement, which strictly isn't actually a piece of C programming. It's actually preprocessor language. Now, the preprocessor is a tool, go back to that early slide, which is run before the compiler. And essentially, the hash defined there is creating uh, a command to look through the program and do a search and replace wherever that tag is seen, replace it with a one. So in fact, so the code itself, the, that, that label name will actually be lost to the compiler. If you look through uh, the actual compiled image, there'll be no reference to it or anything like that. It's purely what's often known as syntactic sugar which overlays the basic program, and it, but it makes for much, much clearer code. And as I, made, as I hinted at a moment ago, it would also make for much more easy, easily modifiable code. So for example, you might only have to change that once if that variable was set, uh, if that constant was set everywhere. The preprocessor, very important tool. Not gonna to talk about it in much more detail this lecture but it becomes quite significant with more sophisticated code. <coughs> so the next thing is, is uh, talking about subfunctions, and functions are, a, are an essential part of any programming technique, and it's something that C does very well, very efficiently, and it allows us to bundle up functionality into a little wrapper. It has two useful functions because if we've got a calculation that is, gets repeated a lot, and I'll give you an example in a second, uh, it, it neatly uh, allows reuse of that functionality very quickly. It also allows for a concept called encapsulation, which in other words, in order to make the code more readable and understandable and maintainable, <coughs> we want to hide the actual details of how a particular function operates because we don't need to know it, and it makes the, the system much more clear, uh, the, the program much more clear. But the function itself has, a, has a, what they call a, a programming interface, and you'll hear people talking about an API, an application programming interface. And, it's very much, and it looks exactly like the main function here, because main is, is nothing more than just a special case of a, of a sub-function. It's just that it's never called from anywhere else. So here we have the outputs from this function. We have an input in this case. You could have more than one. You could have none as well, using that void operator that we saw before. And here's the line of code, this return keyword, which means uh, send that back via the output. So we can see here that that type there ought to match that type there. If we had a float there and an int there, there could be trouble. Not going to go into any more detail about what that trouble would be, but uh, important to get that match right. So here we go when we actually use our function here. We've got a times two, which uh, looks fairly straightforward. Uh, and so we'll illustrate here where we're reusing the function. We're use, calling it once with a with a constant and once with a with a variable, so it can be used in different ways. And we can see this assignment here. So the result, the output of this times two function is assigned directly to these two variables that we've been using. And this also illustrates how the times two function itself is a useful way of burying how we actually perform the multiplication. It seems utterly trivial at the moment, 
but as anybody who knows bi their binary arithmetic will know that there's, there's many ways of performing a times two operation. We could use this times two operator here, or for example, you, know, you will also know that you can multiply a number by two by shifting it in binary to the left by one bit. And so, for example, we might want to change how that function is actually implemented, but it doesn't really, how it happens, that it shouldn't matter to how it's been used further down. And so that allows that detail functionality to be hidden nicely and changed without the other, without the calling program needing to know, as it were. So talking functions, this is a really useful one. Uh, uh, people will always talk about printf and using it. And it's important to understand that printf is, isn't a part of the C language per se. It's just a standard library function which is supported by virtually all C development tools. It allows us to print in a formatted fashion, printf, <coughs> and it's, it's very, very useful for instrumenting what's going on in our program. So when, when we start developing a program running on our remote board, we, we want to know what it's thinking, so we want to output the state of variables and things like that. And we will almost inevitably find ourselves using printf function. So it's very useful to be aware of printf and its strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> printf, you think, well, hang on, how, it, we're saying we're printing to the outside world, and, but, but our D0 board hasn't got a screen attached to it. Not directly, but it can actually report that text back through a remote cable. So in the case of the D0, uh, it reports it back to the NIOS 2 IDE uh, via that USB lead that we also use, use for downloading. And the, so, so it's, and, the, and the IDE, that's the integrated part of it, also supplies a, a virtual screen, as it were, that, the, that that remote board can talk to. So let's have a look at printf. Quite important, there's two parts to it. There's is the format statement on how, these, how this list of arguments or inputs to the function should be translated and displayed. And then the list itself. Now, this is where the fun starts because there is nothing at compile time that checks whether the format there it matches those arguments there. So let's have a look how it gets used. So here's, here's a, print, a typical printf statement in line in a piece of code. And uh, the first thing we'll notice is that we've had to do another of these preprocessor directives. And this is what's called a hash include. And what that does is, in the same way that hash define is effectively search and replace, is that uh, hash include just says, right, copy the entire contents of that file into this place here. Splat it in. And, in, and one of the many things that is within this stdio.h file is a little warning to the compiler to say, don't worry, printf, you might not be able to find it in this piece of code here but it's going to crop up later, fear not. So you'll always see that includes stud.io, as people often call it, whenever there's a printf and other interact, uh, outside world interactions. So now, here's where the fun starts. We've got our two variables, and here we'll see, compared to those, we have a percent %d and a percent %f. So these, this informs the printf statement how to decode those numbers. So this one says, right, unsigned integer coming up and this one says right float in, uh, float coming up as well and lo and behold that matches with the list that is a manual step important to understand because disaster ensues if you get that wrong the other interesting thing here is this slash n which means carriage return u line so that informs the virtual console that we were looking at sort of based on the idea of the old teletype machine to say yes now return your cursor to the beginning of the next line. And so here we go, here's my printf statement executed in a typical console program, and we get a display of the values right through to several decimal places in this case. Beware of printf. Printf is very flaky, it's a very powerful tool, but it can catch you out something rotten.
So here, there's a whole way, series of ways that you can possibly make a mess. These are just examples. I think I've made a mess of printf in every possible way imaginable during my software career. So let's just take this first example. Look, we've got the percent %f and the percent %d mixed up. So what will end up happening there is the printf statement will consume the int variable thinking that it's a float and the way the bits are arranged between an int and a float are completely different and you'll just get absolutely crazy numbers displayed. And there's a whole series of other ways of fluffing it as well. Beware! And usually when people get nonsense values, the first coming out of their, their instrumentation, the first thing to check is whether your printf statement is right. So, as setting up variables and displaying them, then usually the next key part of any piece of software is conditional execution, as it's known, in other words, an if statement, and this should be utterly familiar with, to you if you've dealt with any scripting languages like MATLAB. The, uh, the basic layout, the basic concept of an if statement is exactly the same. The syntax is a wee bit different, so we can see we've got this open and close braces again, which display scope show what, what is the code which is going to be conditionally executed. And the other interesting point here is we've got this double equal, the example I've particularly used is a comparison, and that's a double equal, so that means test if equal to, it doesn't mean becomes equal to one, test if equal to one, there's a difference and it's very easy to get them mixed up. It's a famous weakness in C, because the trouble is it will compile. I don't want to go into the technicalities of it, but x e single equals 1 would actually be consumed and give, and give some very strange results. So here we can see if statement, very straightforward, all used to using them, but even the, even the humble if statement comes with a few caveats. So first thing is, C doesn't actually insist on you having a scope braces around this code here, but put them in anyway, even if we've got a single line of code, <coughs> otherwise you will have a ticking time bomb in your code. Why? The reason is, is quite often an inexperienced programmer might come along and write a second line of code here, which he thinks is indented, especially if they're familiar with programming in, a, in another scripted language like Python, in which the indentation defines the nesting. And that would, and he would write a piece of code here, expecting that to be part of the conditional statement. Not so, it would simply execute the first one. Better just to put those scope braces in anyway, and defend against future mistakes. And I think this goes back to a general point about writing code: is any fool can make write code for themselves and get it to work. The trick is writing code which is maintainable and upgradable in the future not only by other people, but you'll even find upgrading it by yourself when you come back to something weeks or even months later, you think, what was I thinking? So think about yourself as much as anybody else and make good, future-proof, maintainable code. And here's a good example of one. So talking of safe code, uh, we've talked about an if statement. There's also the if-else as well, which is also uh, available in MATLAB and every other language as well. And it's quite worth it's worth bearing in mind that there's a lot of conditions where you might want to use the if else statement because this the nice thing about an if else statement this will guarantee execution of one or other li of these lines regardless of of what that value is it'll always that that whatever value comes out of this this function here something will trigger. So even if it's just a printf statement, ah, I'm going to do nothing, it's probably worth putting that in. So not always true, sometimes just an if statement on its own is fine, but beware if you've got, if you're handling various conditions important to, uh, to, to capture the, the non-handled conditions as well. So a sort of fall through, exception handling, I suppose, in a way. And it guarantees that handling of any of the outcomes. And that point stretches even further to this, that's often called an else-if ladder. 
and uh, MATLAB does it again. In fact, MATLAB has its own keyword called ELSIF, one word, and a lot of high-level languages do. In C, it gets sort of created by this chaining effect, so we have else space if, but the point still stands that whatever happens, we will execute down through a whole series of possibilities. And one and only one of those possibilities will be executed. And so it's quite useful to it's quite a useful construct to use when you're doing conditional code. And it, but it is important to remember that the order that those if if and else if statements will occur will affect the priority of who gets first test, as it were. So we can see here if it's less than zero, but if if that if that fails and we go through to this test here, we already know that the value is greater than or equal or equal to zero by the time we reach here. Hence this comment here is a little bit richer than is immediately apparent. So else if ladders useful, but they do come with some tricky uh, functionality sort of uh, implied within them. And a good way to finish your else if ladder is always have an else at the end for the very same reasons that we talked about previously. So the other one that we're all familiar with, I hope, is were loops. And I'm going to specifically talk about the while loop and the for loop, both of which again exist in MATLAB. There's actually also it's, it's uh, the while loop's brother, the do while loop. I'm not going to talk about that, and I'll leave you to look it up. Uh, it's, it's, the functionality is very similar to a while loop. So there's two, why two ways of doing, of doing a loop? Well, horses for courses, as with all these things. Um, the while, the while loop itself is quite useful if we're going to generally spin round potentially forever until some sort of exit criteria occurs. So if we're consuming something where the, the beginning and end of the loop isn't necessarily clear, this might be, for example, something that's gathering information in from the outside world through one of our D0 inputs or something like that. And we don't know whether we're going to exit or not. But it's important to understand that they, all these exit statements that cause you to fall through, uh, will call you, cause you to terminate this loop. <coughs> it's very easy, again, going back to this point about future-proof code, for, for, the, for the contents of this loop here, the body, to bloat quite quickly. And generally, a good rule of thumb is once it's more than a page on the screen, and the top and, the, and, the, the top and bottom of the loop have become lost, to the human eye and hence the human mind. Uh, generally, that's a good point at which the alarm bells start ringing and you say you need to condense that functionality somehow by wrapping things into sub-functions and things like that. Beware. But the while loop certainly has its place, but uh, in many ways, a more elegant solution to a lot of problems is a for loop. And um, this is particularly useful when you're traversing through an array, a list of it, and you want to go one, two, three, as you as you parse your way across a line or through a list of files or something like that. The for loop is, has the same functionality effectively, but just the way it's laid out and presented is a wee bit different. So here, and I like the for loop for this sort of thing, because the entire description of the, lo of the loop's functionality is contained within that one line, so we can see exactly what the conditions are. And there's three parts to that, that one line. We've got the thing that we want to do on entry. Now we can have x equals 1, and you could do other things as well. You have an exit criteria, which sometimes I feel ought to go at the end, but that's the syntax. And the, and the action that should, must be performed ev after every time. So you can think of that action there as happening just before that closed brace there. And so, very efficient way of displaying how we want to spin through a loop or something like that, traverse a, traverse a list or an array or something like that, and we'll talk about arrays another time. So, this interesting point here is, um, <coughs> let's compare the two. So what's the difference in functionality between those two loops? None whatsoever. But I maintain that <coughs> for the particular case here of where all we want to do is count through the numbers 0 to 9, inclusive, the for loop is a more elegant way of doing it. However, if we were doing something like reading a keypad or something, 
the for loop would start to look a bit strange, and I think we'd probably go to a while loop. And I think you'll see that in the D0 code. But yeah, very useful to hold those two up to the light and, and compare. Same functionality, different syntax, uh, and they both have their place. So one thing that often gives away inexperienced programmers is their lack of comments in the code. And so comments don't appear to add anything to a program until you come back to it a few, few months later. So these are bits of plain text embedded in the code explaining what on earth's going on in there. It can be anything from a header explaining what this particular file was and who wrote it and when through to wee bits of functionality like this, even where there's something here where they're saying there's nothing going on, but there ought to, but there will be in the future, sort of to-do and things like that. So it's a letter to the next person that picks up that piece of code in the future. And the, the big motive is, nine times out of ten, that next person will be yourself, where you, and when you come back to the code, having completely forgotten about what on earth you were doing. So think of it as a, as a love letter through time to you, to the next Perl sap that picks it up. So another point there is you'll notice that the C syntax supports two different types of C. Uh, this used to be the C++, it's two different comments, sorry. This is the old C++ um, single line comment. So in other words, everything on that line onwards till the carriage return will be ignored. And this is the original C. And the C++ one was, was uh, added to the, lang the C language, but sort of retrofitted to the C language, the C99 um, standard that came out in 1999. <coughs> so use comments, very important. And so you can see here, although I've, I haven't actually used a, uh, a hash-defined constant here, um, like I should have done, I've done the next best thing by putting a comment in it clearly explains why I'm returning zero at that point. Uh, and, that's, and you can imagine that, that could make quite a big difference to somebody instead of them having to work it out for themselves. So comments are important. And in no way does all that extra code compromise your, your compiled program. Because what actually happens is pre before it's compiled, all those comments are stripped out and discarded. So uh, you can have as many comments as you like. It won't slow down the program or, or the, even the compilation very much. So that's C generally. I, uh, because this, the idea of this lecture is su to support you guys with your use of D0 boards, <coughs> I just want to talk specifically about uh, some of the code you've, uh, you've probably already looked at and maybe puzzled over. So. Bearing in mind what we've just considered, let's return to that D0 function of Nigel's that he provides to operate the uh, pulse width modulation hardware on the D0. And I hope with knowing what we now know, some of it makes a bit more sense. So what we've got here are these header files, just like stud.io, but these ones have been written by probably Nigel to support the hardware on the D0. And they're defining these little bits of functionality here. They're actually defined using uh, preprocessor directives, which don't completely approve of, but go on. It's, uh, it's high speed, very efficient. And leave you to go and puzzle through the rest of it. The key point I want to make there is that these functions are specific to the piece of hardware that this code has been written for. It's not generic, this is dedicated, this, this code is specific to, to running on the D0, not only the D0, but D0 programmed up with that particular firmware configuration in its FPGA. But Nigel knows that we've got some board functionality, which is maps, as it's called, of registers in the memory map of the device. So in other words, if it looks in a particular location in memory, instead of seeing a piece of RAM, which we can read and write, information too freely, we'll see a device. So we could read back, say, the, the result of an A to D conversion or something like that, or write the required uh, voltage out for a D, uh, a D to A conversion. <coughs> 
So those functions are therefore declared here in these .h files. And if you go into NIOS2 IDE and find those files, they're in the project, uh, the downloaded imported project, and you can see the contents of them and understand how that's actually implemented. So you can see here the these PWM registers I just do nothing more than force the device to look at a particular offset from those from the base address of the devices in memory. And that's how we get to interact with our hardware. These devices, these, this method is known as a macro, which effectively is instead of just a fixed constant, we could even just write code. Because as I say, it's a, it's a cut and paste effect. And once you realize that it is just cut and paste, copy and paste uh, in this hash define, you realize that there's nothing to stop you using, putting software in there. So I think this page is incredibly useful, actually. It's something I put together. Uh, there's, there's many, many mistakes <coughs> which happen all the time uh, in C. C is particularly prone to encouraging programming errors. But these four, I think, I think these seem to dominate people who are, are picking up C for the very first time, certainly from my observation in the labs and things like that. So those four, very important. First thing people always forget to do, especially if you've come from a scripted language where it doesn't matter, if you keep forgetting to put semicolons at the end of the line. That assignment and comparison mix-up happens all the time. So as I mentioned earlier, that if x equals 1, that doesn't actually test to see if x equals 1. Um, and so I'll even think about why not. By all means, come and ask me. And you'll get some very strange functionality. Printf, as I've hinted quite heavily, Printf is quite a, f is a powerful but very fragile tool. Spend a lot, spend, takes an effort to check that that formatting part of the Printf statement matches the list of variables that you've asked it to print out. And another classic one is, especially people who are used to begin and end or no explicit start to a loop and things like that, people leaving out either a closed brace or, a, or a an open brace. And that's a particularly daunting bug because the way that the compiler sees the code, if you miss one of those out, is particularly hard to fathom. So if you've got a huge piece of code <coughs> and then and leave one pe we leave a brace off somewhere in the middle of it all, the, it's particularly hard to hunt down and find. So watch out for those four. If your code isn't working for some reason, either not compiling or worse still, in many ways, compiling but not running in the, in the right way that you're expecting it, look out for those top four disasters that certainly seem to come along. There's plenty of other uh, problems waiting for you as you become more sophisticated at programming, but I would say those are very good ones to look out for in the early days. So just as a little warm-up exercise, I've thrown that in, and that pretty much captures a whole bunch of those the sort of errors that crop up. And I'll leave you to look at that and try and scratch your head over where the errors are. There's eight. Some might say more. I'll give you a clue. More if you include the idea of uh, richer comments required. So I'll just fast forward through it, but to encourage you to... Uh, download the slides and have a look, there's the answer. Oh, gone. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, that's enough, about the language itself. And, and there's a lot that we haven't come to yet. C is huge, and so there's a lot more to talk about. These are the things that I can think of that I haven't put in. There's even more sophisticated concepts out there, particularly when one starts to think about how that C is being translated into the executable that's going to go down into that target process that we were talking about. So if anybody needs uh, some, some support on all those other issues, get in touch, maybe another lecture might be appropriate. So uh, also, uh, so there's one good thing about C, is there's a huge amount of 
support out there. Don't take my word for it from this lecture. There's huge numbers of tutorials, and in fact, the UE here, some very good tutorials on, online on the uh, lynda.com website. You have to go, you have to enter it through the library, UE library, because, uh, Lin, uh, but you have, we have a subscription to lynda.com. Follow those instructions. You can hunt down a whole series of C programming tutorials on lynda.com videos, so you can uh, get yourself a cup of tea and watch those videos. However, there's no substitute for rolling your sleeves up and actually having a go at writing some code. Uh, trying to uh, learn C by watching a lecture like this one is a bit like learning to drive a car by listening to a lecture. Useful up to a point. So uh, again, plenty of goodies and tools out there, all free, for available for programming with all sorts of different features in them. If you're just going to write code to run on the desktop, I personally I really like this one, the Microsoft Stu uh, Visual Studio Express, the C tool for that. There's others as well that other people feel strongly about. Uh, and then when you get into writing target devices, we're, we're obviously all familiar with NIOS 2 IDE, but for things like particular uh, target boards, there's, uh, there's got their own specialist um, innovative development environments. The, the one I'm very impressed with is this Cypress Creator thing. Uh, if you're using uh, Arduino or Raspberry Pi, <coughs> there's support for those as well. Uh, but I, I couldn't really define a preferred tool set there because there seems to be a lot more uh, controversy within the department, uh, within the the communities about which are the better tool chains, it's a bit more fragmented. So I'll leave you to go and Google on that for those two target devices. So let's just sum up. As you can see, C is a lightweight language. It looks lightweight. There's not much text on the screen. Sometimes it looks like an explosion in a typewriter factory. And that's pretty good. It compiles fast. And it certainly runs fast as well, because uh, it's, it was actually written as a, as a sort of high-level alternative to assembler, rather than a low-level uh, alternative to object-oriented languages like C++ and Java. So it sort of floated upwards. So that's good, but lightweight is also comes with its problems, because essentially by make, they make it lightweight by effectively kicking a lot of decisions up to the programmer so with power comes responsibility as with all things in life so watch out but uh, C is most ubiquitous language I must be the only person I know who's been writing the same programming language for 25 years now <laughs> longer and so it's well it's a, it's a tool that's very very useful to have in your back pocket thoroughly recommend you're becoming familiar with it. And also the, the number of tools and tutorials and support textbooks and whatnot is astronomical out there. A lot of it's free. Um, so yeah, well worth looking out for. Uh, any questions as usual, please get in touch. Uh, particularly interested in if uh, as part of the analog course people would like to have some more detail on the um, uh, of more sophisticated programming, uh, C programming techniques. Best of luck, and see you soon.